Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we, I think we are just about ready to get started. Yep, we sure are. So thank you so much for being here. My name is Erica and I am part of the Denver Public Library team. And I'm delighted to be hosting Denver Public Library's second annual Battle of the Books, part of our Winter of Reading program. So uh, just a, one quick thing to enable closed captioning, click on the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, please. And uh, we have such an incredible panel of literary gladiators with us tonight. Um, I am so excited to hear uh, to hear about their favorite book. And we did this last year and I absolutely had a blast. My book didn't necessarily win. That's okay, it's a still a great book. And I know that tonight you will be hearing uh, about a few really incredible books. But first, let me introduce this evening's moderator, the one and only Jim Mustick. Uh, now Jim began his career in book selling at an independent bookstore in Briarcliff Manor, New York. Uh, in the early 1980s. In 1986, he co-founded the acclaimed book catalog, A Common Reader, and was for two decades its guiding force. He subsequently has worked as an editorial and product development executive in the publishing industry, and his book, 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, 14 Years in the Writing, was published uh, to great acclaim in October 2018. The Washington Post called it the ultimate literary bucket list. And oh, the Oprah Magazine said, if there's a heaven just for readers, this is it. Jim lives with his wife, Margot, in Connecticut. And I am pleased to introduce you to Jim. Take it away. Thank you, Erica. It's great to be back uh, doing this again virtually. I hope sometime soon I'll be able to get out to the Denver Public Library to do this in person. But tonight, I'm delighted to be here with all of you tuning in. Looks like we have over 100 people already tuned in, so welcome. Um, I'd like to thank the Denver Public Library for hosting this celebration of books. I'm thrilled to have the Battle of the Books be part of its winter reading festivities for the second year in a row. Last January, the battle was won by soul food scholar Adrian Miller, who dropping knowledge like biscuits, as he likes to say, made everybody hungry with his case for the taste of country cooking by Edna Lewis. I'd especially like to thank the libraries Dodie Onis and Jennifer Dewey and Kat Burney for planning and coordinating this over the past several weeks. They've been wonderful collaborators. And special thanks to Ashara Lior for managing the technology that enables us to convene this remote event. I especially thank our five contestants, Dr. Renee Fiardo, David Heska Wandley Wyden, Chris Parente, Dr. Clark, Carl Clark, Clark, excuse me, Dr. Carl Clark, and Representative Leslie Herod. I will interest, introduce them all more fully momentarily, but first a little more housekeeping. A big thanks to our book selling partner, Book Bar on Tennyson Street where you can purchase all the books you're going to hear about tonight, including mine. In the Zoom chat, you'll find a link to a page on Book Bar's website to enable that, or you can call or email them. Of course, of course, you can also borrow most, if not all, of the books from the library. You can look for links in the chat or go to the library's website to search the catalog. We're recording tonight's program, and it will be posted on the library's YouTube channel in the next few days. But let me set the stage for what we're about to do. At times like these, it's good to have the company of books, which provide so many experiences that nourish and sustain our inner lives, even when the outer world might seem forbidding. Whether we seek escape, consolation, suspense, engagement, education, philosophy, wit, or wisdom, reading offers us a path to it. That's what makes libraries such beacons of welcome and wonder. And if the company of books is good, so is the company of readers and the conversation they engage in, which is what our battles of the books are all about. Let me quickly tell you how they came to be. I spent a long time writing my book, Thousand Books to Read Before You Die, right here. Uh, it's nearly a thousand pages long. And for it, I wrote a thousand 
brief, but I hope inviting essays on books ranging from the works of Agatha Christie to those of Abraham Lincoln, from the Epic of Gilgamesh encoded on tablets in Babylon 4,000 years ago, to Life in Code, A Personal History of Technology by Ellen Ullman, published in 2017. I spent 14 years writing it, and when it was finally published in fall 2018, my wife Margo and I traveled around the country talking about the project in bookstores and libraries to gatherings like this. Invariably, the best part of those evenings were the Q and A's with the audience afterward, which quickly made me realize, as I had suspected, that I was going to spend the next 14 years of my life hearing from readers what I'd gotten wrong in the book, the books I'd left out, the authors I should have included. I did anticipate this. In the introduction to the book, I wrote this. Once people know you are writing a book called 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, you can never enjoy a dinner party in quite the way you did before. No matter how many books you've managed to consider, and no matter how many pages you've written, every conversation with a fellow reader is almost sure to provide new titles to seek out, or more worryingly, to expose an egregious omission or a gap in your knowledge, to say nothing of revealing the privileges and prejudices however unwitting, underlying your points of reference. For years, a thousand books felt like far too many to get my head around, but now it seems too few by several multiples. So let me say what already should be obvious. 1,000 books to read before you die is neither comprehensive nor authoritative, nor is it meant to be. It is meant to be an invitation to a conversation, even a merry argument, about the books and authors that are missing, as well as the books and authors included, because the question of what to read next is the best prelude to even more important ones, like who to be and how to live. As I said, the conversations after my book tour talks were always the best part of those evenings because they were animated by just the sort, sort of merry arguments my introduction invoked. And one night, Margot had the inspired idea to make the merry arguments themselves the main event. Thus, the Battle of the Books was born, landing us in communities where local luminaries could share their own favorite books with us and their neighbors, and the audience would vote on who was most persuasive. Persuasive. Which brings us to our battle tonight, so let's get to it. I will introduce our contestants one by one, and they will each speak for four minutes about a book I left off my list of a thousand books that they think everybody should read. I will, single them, I will signal them gently with a bell when they have 30 seconds left, and then more vehemently when they hit the four minute mark. After all five contestants have pitched their books, you'll cast your vote for who was most convincing. All registered audience members will have the chance to vote to choose tonight's winner, one vote per device, and I'll tell you how to do that when the time for voting comes around. The winner will receive a signed copy of my book, and the runner-up will get the chance to come back and do battle in Denver Public Library's next Battle of the Books. All the contestants will, re will receive a Winter of Reading swag bag from the library. Okay, so much for the windup. now the pitches. Leading off tonight is Dr. Renee Fiardo, who last January in our first Battle of the Books at DPL was a very close runner-up to Adrian Miller, with her superb advocacy, advocacy for Bless Me Ultima by Rudolfo Anyaya. Dr. Fiardo is program director for the Metropolitan State University of Denver Journey Through Our Heritage program, a multicultural leadership program under the Department of Chicana, Chicano Studies. A Denver native and graduate of the University of Nebraska, she is also a freelance writer specializing in the Southwest. She is the co-author of the Holy Mole Guacamole Tummy Tale series with Carl Ruby, a series of children's books on food, culture, and family. The book she'll be talking about tonight is No Pepperonis, Just Chicarones and Other Tummy Tales by Magdalena Galagos. Renee, great to see you again. Hi, so I wanna thank everyone. Um, that is here, all my esteemed colleagues at Denver Public Library, and especially the must, must, 
my stitches. I'm gonna, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, this is really thrilling for me. And um, so that I don't get time for that when I, I'm gonna start now. I'm gonna start, right? Okay. Okay, I'm ready. Here we go. Independently published by Gems Books of Arvada, No Pepperonis, Just Chicharronis and Other Tummy Tales is the seventh book in a collection of family food stories sponsored by the Colorado Folk Arts Council, the Chicano Humanities Arts Council, and MSU Denver Chicano Chicano Studies Journey Through Our Heritage Program. It is edited by renowned Spanish English editor Ed Winograd, illustrated by Chicana Miralis Arlette Lucero, and co authored by Carl Ruby. This delightful anthology pays tribute to the ethnic and cultural culinary heritages of Colorado. This small book tonight kicks off a literary intrigue, however. Here are two clues. Among my challengers, my dear colleague from MSU Denver, and among the presented books, my daughter's book. So let the battle begin. One reason to vote for this book because it contains not one, but 13 stories from some of the Southwest best authors, including Deborah Martinez Martinez, Charlene Garcia Sims, Lois Burrell, Dr. Sandra Doe, Dr. Vanjie Senna, Lorene Wolf, Marjorie Domingo, David Henley, and John Wallace. And that's actually his story. These touching stories also highlight regional takes on such recipes as gingerbread cookies, peach dumplings, Southern cheese biscuits, Filipino frijoles, roasted goats, atole, and empanadas. The title story is really about my great Tio, Uncle Jakey, who always wore pink polka dotted aprons and had the audacity to tell me I could not put chicharrones on my pizza. But it is contributing author Magdalena Gallegos, an iconic Denver Chicana community activist and storyteller who passed away in the spring of 2021, a few months prior to publication that makes this book so special. Gallegos was born in 1935 and grew up on Denver's Yo West Side. And that was a place where many people had come and migrated from Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico. Gallegos' story, The Christmas Treasure, passed on to her from her mother, Florence Torres Gallegos, speaks to the history of a people who can trace their heritage back hundreds of years to a time when the Spanish began marrying into the indigenous populations of what is now North America. Our people built adobe homes, cleared acequias, sheared sheep, carved santos, used mixed tamal corn to make tamales and celebrated not Santa Claus at Christmas, but posadas. As Gallegos wrote, Tio Benito told stories about Christmas Eve in New Mexico, where the city lights glowed with lighted candles called luminarias. He told how for nine days before Christmas, groups of people went from house to house reenacting the first Christmas, a humble tradition filled with love for community and the joy of belonging. No Pepperonis is not a literary masterpiece, but it is a testimony to the importance of small stories. Our ancestors' struggles and triumphs live in our DNA. Small stories about family, all families, and their multitude of diversity are a reminder that we are all more alike than we are different. By passing on these stories of love for each other, we create the possibilities for a better, more just world. How beautiful to find our common humanity in our family food tales. In loving memory of Magdalena Gallegos. Thank you so much. That's that's perfect, Renee, and right on time. Four <laughs> minutes exactly. And very cunning, I will say, to talk about food at the dinner hour. I think you've got, according to the chat, you've made many people hungry. So thank you for that. Next up is David Heska Wandley Wyden. David is an enrolled citizen of the Sichangut Lakota Nation and the author of Winter Counts, Counts, nominated for the Edgar Award and winner of the Anthony Thriller Lefty Barry McCavity Spur High Plains and Tilly Olson Awards. The novel was a New York Times editor choice, an Indie Next pick, 
main selection of the Book of the Month Club and named a best book of 2020 by NPR, Amazon, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and other magazines. David's book tonight is Winter in the Blood by James Welch. David, welcome and thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Denver Public Library, for inviting me to this wonderful event. It's really my pleasure and my honor to be here tonight. And I, I also want to thank Denver Public Library for your support of my book, Winter Counts, because you guys have been behind this book since the very beginning. Um, I have just heard that the book has sold uh, 100,000 copies, which is wonderful. But what I love most is the thousands of libraries that have bought a copies of Winter Counts for people that can't afford to buy their own. And this is something that means a lot to me personally, because I grew up quite poor. I grew up in uh, the Denver neighborhood of Swansea, Illyria. We didn't have a library, okay? We didn't have a library anywhere near us, but we had the bookmobile. The Denver Public Library bookmobile came to Swansea Elementary School every Friday afternoon, and I would check out a stack of books, and I would read those. And this really ignited my love of literature and ultimately my career as a writer. So I just can't thank Denver Public Library enough. And I want to say to everybody watching that we need to support our libraries. Libraries are under attack right now, and we need to support them. So it really means a lot. So let me start the time now. You're welcome. Let me start the time now. Um, as has been mentioned, my book that I have chosen is the highly important and significant book, Winter in the Blood by James Welch. Now, I just want to say that when I received my first check from HarperCollins from the sale of my book, Winter Counts, I didn't go out and buy something splashy or whatever. I bought this book right here. This is a signed first edition of Winter in the Blood. That should tell you how much this book means to me. Uh, this is the Penguin edition of Winter in the Blood by James Welch. And so, and I also want to point out that I am really honored. Uh, I've been asked to speak at the inaugural James Welch uh, Native American Literature Festival this July in Missoula, Montana. I'll be speaking with my friends Stephen Graham Jones and Rebecca Roanhorse. And so, you know, James Welch to me has been one of my heroes. And so to speak at the, the first conference in, in his name is truly an honor. Let me tell you a little bit about James Welch and Winner in the Blood and why you should vote for this. James Welch is one of the most important Native American authors. He was born in Montana in 1940. He is Blackfeet and Grovant. He grew up on the Fort Belknap Reservation. He received his bachelor's degree and his MFA from the University of Montana. He is considered to be a founding author of the Native American Renaissance, the first wave of highly important and significant authors uh, of Native American uh, heritage. He was given the Knight of the Order of Arts and Letters by the French Cultural Ministry. His novels have been translated into nine different languages, and Winter in the Blood was finally made into a film in 2012 after being published in 1974. Let me tell you a little bit about this book, which is indeed a literary masterpiece. The novel tells the story of a young Native American man who is never named and he takes a journey home to re reclaim his family and his culture. The unnamed narrator is tormented by visions, and he's haunted by the deaths of his father and brother. After struggling with guilt, sorrow, and alcoholism, the narrator overcomes these problems by reclaiming his culture with the help of his grandfather, Yellow Calf. Folks, this is an honest novel sad at times, but ultimately it's a story of redemption. The lesson of the book is that Native Americans should embrace our cultures in order to heal the wounds of cultural genocide and the loss of our lands. The theme, reclaiming one's identity, is of course universal. Now let me just point a few things out about why this is such an important book. It has been voted one of the 10 most important Native American books ever. So the critics all agree, this is one of the most significant books in the history of Native American literature. The themes, what James Welch did, he's the first author to really explore the themes of Native identity, 
rejection of assimilation and recovery from substance abuse. And finally, his prose. Welch was trained as a poet, and it's quite clear. He mixes poetic language with hard edge realism to create a unique style, prose style, of Native American literature. Folks, this book is one of the most important books in the entire canon of Native American literature. It deserves to be in the book, the 1,000 best books. Let me close. Winter in the Blood. It is written in a circular, nonlinear style. It's impossible to put down, okay? It's a great read, but it's more than just a page turner. Winter in the Blood achieves what all great novels aspire to. It entertains and educates, and it connects us to our own humanity. Folks, even if this doesn't win tonight, I really urge you to go out and read Winter in the Blood, as well, of all, as, well as all of his novels, The Death of Jim Loney, you know, he doesn't have a bad one in the bunch. James Welch, one of our most important and sadly overlooked uh, uh, novelists in the Native American canon. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you, David, for that wonderful evocation of that book. Uh, well done. And especially for your uh, wonderful evocation of the wonders of libraries and what they do for all of us. Our third contestant is Chris Parente. Chris is a seven-time Emmy Award-winning reporter, anchor, and entertainment host. And I think he's going to be nominated for another Emmy for the short film he made of the interview he did with me this week, which some of you may have seen on TV, which was quite astonishing and delightful. Um, he's been in the TV business for more than 24 years, which clearly means he started when he was five. Prior to coming to Denver, <laughs> He was the morning anchor at WAVE TV in Louisville, Kentucky. You can watch him weekdays from 4.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. co-anchoring Daybreak on Channel 2. Tonight, he's going to talk about Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel. And Chris, take it away. Thank you very much, Jim, and happy Saturday to one and all. I am Chris Parente, morning anchor over there at Channel 2 Daybreak. I'm honored to be here talking about the power of a book to transform, to inspire, and to occasionally serve as a doorstop, because you all know you've done it. Books are very versatile. We know this. Uh, you may have noticed I'm going full on Oprah tonight. I am 360 Oprah. Uh, same shirt I wore when I interviewed her a couple years back. And I do this for two reasons tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Number one, Miss Oprah agrees with me on my choice. In fact, it was her number one pick, best novel of 2014. So side note, as Leslie noted earlier, if you pick my book, you get a car and you get a car. We all get cars. Everybody's a winner. <laughs> and the second thing, second reason I'm going full on Oprah tonight is she's a reminder to me of the power of television to elevate the conversation. I think too often we assume TV is the enemy. It doesn't have to be that way. It's my commitment every morning on Channel 2 to get folks talking, to talk about the things that unite us, inspire us, and yes, to talk about books. As Jim mentioned, he was a guest on my show last week. Jim got higher ratings than I did. Thank you, which tells you everything you need to know about the power of books. So let's come together right now and agree with one voice that this year's Battle of the Books Crown belongs squarely on the head of Station 11. For those of you who don't know what the cover looks like, I do read all my stuff on uh, electronically. Now, of course, the initial bonus of this novel is it's about to become a TV drama on HBO. So you'll have the distinct pleasure of telling your friends what the TV adaptation got wrong. We all love doing that, right? And there's a reason why they're making it into a TV movie because a good story is a good story. I think at this time, maybe more than any other, we're aware of how delicate this web of society is, of how one virus can knock us out, lock us down, stop the wheels in their tracks. My husband and I read Station 11 together at the start of the pandemic, and we found it oddly comforting. Station 11 doesn't focus on the, uh, the apocalypse. There's not a morbid focus on the violent downfall. This ain't World War Z. 
Instead, the focus is on the before and the after and the threads that connect us from either side. The novel focusing on both those sides does it in a way where the characters have depth, they're vulnerable. It's a delight learning about those who lived in the final moments before and in the decades after. The writing is superb, the characters are well fleshed out, the heartbreak and the heart uh, breakthroughs are both profound, they were to me. And I think for those of us that have endured COVID-19, strikes a special chord. And a final note tonight, whether you read this no novel or not, when you, when you end the book, you understand deeply, I think, how art, how music, how culture finds a way, how we humans are bound to our stories and bound to expression so deeply that no virus can kill our desire to express, to perform, to create art and keep it alive. That to me was the linchpin of the whole thing. So whether you vote for Station Eleven or whether you choose to deeply disappoint Oprah Winfrey, I do hope if you haven't read the novel, you'll treat yourself and discover that even in a not so happily ever after, like maybe the one you're in right now, we can still find joy and humanity and art and that that might just be enough. And in the few seconds I have left, I do want to close by uh, acknowledging my husband, Luis, who's actually watching downstairs on his laptop. Luis is a first grade teacher with DPS and he is my inspiration. His passion for reading, his belief that books can open doors and windows for our children. Every night I see him pouring over all these books, how they could impact his kids. Luis is my happily ever after. And Jim, it gives me an idea. Maybe next it's a thousand books to read before you grow up. Just throwing that out there. Thank you all for letting me be a part of the night. And I surely hope you'll vote for Station Eleven. Chris, thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. And I, I have had the idea of a thousand books to read before you grow up. I think it's a great one. I think uh, my publisher waited so long for the first one. I don't know if I could get them interested, but I'll see. Um, but wonderful. Uh, I loved what you said about how central stories are to uh, inspiring us uh, from day to day and from year to year. Our fourth contestant is Dr. Carl Clark. As the president and CEO of the Mental Health Center of Denver, Dr. Clark inspires a culture of innovation and well being by delivering strength based, person centered, culturally proficient services, as well as employing trauma informed, evidence based practices. Dr. Clark is going to be speaking tonight about Humankind A Hopeful History by Rutger Bergman. Carl, take it away. All right, thanks, Jim. I would like to thank the Denver Public Library and the Denver Public Library partners for putting this event together and for inviting me. I hope that we're inspired to read all the books that are presented here today. I am a humble book reader. I'm a bookworm. I love reading. I do read a book a week. And I see reading as a way to upgrade the software of my brain. I love engaging stories that help me see the world in a different way and myself differently. Occasionally, I read a book where I say, wow, that changed me. Humankind, A Hopeful History by historian Rutger Bergman is that book for me, and I believe it will be that book for you too. If there's one thing that unites the left and the right, psychologists and philosophers, modern thinkers and ancient thinkers, is the assumption that humans are bad. We're taught human beings are selfish and motivated by self-interest. What if that is not true? So, Rutger Bergman provides this new perspective on the past 200,000 years of humanity and proves that 
we are actually hardwired for kindness. That it's more about cooperation than competition and that we're inclined to trust rather than to mistrust one another. Mind blowing, isn't it? He exams, examines how our negative, um, negativity bias, that thing where we're watching for, what's that dangerous thing? What's that bad thing? What's that thing I got to watch out for? Couples with news coverage that makes us think that we're bad people. Remember Lord of the Flies? Well, there's a real life story of some boys who stole a boat, crashed on a deserted island. They didn't find them for 18 months. And when they did, they found a cooperative society, not savagery. So in humankind, a hopeful history, uh, Bregman is bringing together lots of different disciplines, psychology, history, politics, archeology, span and many others, and concludes, Humans are decidedly good. He says that the book was in the air and that somebody was going to write it and feels humble to be the author. So in this extraordinary time of challenges, the pandemic, global climate change, people pitting one another against each other, we need to assume the best in each other. Bregman does not ask us to be optimistic. He does ask us to be hopeful because hope compels us to act. Now, cruelty and violence do exist, but the data shows most people don't wanna hurt other people. And it's interesting, how we see other people is really what we get. So when we see the best in people, when we see the best in people, we get the best in people. So I, whether you vote for this book tonight, I hope you do. I encourage you to read it, to have your friends read it, your family, your colleagues, because it'll change you. Carl, thank you. Sounds like a wonderful book for this time uh, of our lives uh, and uh, well described. Our final contestant tonight, is Representative Leslie Herod. Representative Herod was elected in 2016 as the first LGBTQ African American in the Colorado General Assembly. Since then, she has passed over 100 bills addressing criminal justice reform, mental health, addiction, youth homelessness, and civil rights protections. Her book, Sabrina and Corina by Callie Fajardo Anstein. Um, that's her book, and she's going to talk about it now. Leslie, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you for Denver, to Denver Public Library for putting this on. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm State Representative Leslie Herod, uh, and I got to tell you, the competition is a bit stiff with some of these books that have been introduced, but I want to talk to you about my favorite book, uh, Sabrina and Karina. Um, this is one of my non-political, but maybe so, books that is my absolute favorite. And I'm actually holding up a paper copy because I can't find my hardback because I must have given it out to, uh, to someone in loan because I just love it that much. Um, so Kali Fajardo Anstein um, is someone I actually met through social media because of how impactful this book was to me. This is her debut collection set largely in Denver, Colorado, and she explores what it means to be Latina, Indigenous, and females in ways that are are both touching and powerful. In fact, she takes aim at our country's social injustices and ills without succumbing to pessimism. The result is a nearly perfect collection of stories that is emotionally wrenching, but never without glimmers of resistance and hope. The plot of the stories in Sabrina and Karina may appear familiar at first glance. I know they did to me, not because we've seen them on the pages before, but because we've lived some version of them. I'm gonna give you an example by reading an excerpt. By our mid twenties, I saw Sabrina less and less. She worked nights, I worked days. She moved a few times and I lost track of her addresses, the names of her friends, the men she dated, the bars she tended. She rarely went to family dinners. 
but when she did, she was puffy eyed and sallow skinned, her slinky tops always falling off her shoulders. She'd gulp cup, cups of black coffee like water, laughing at her own jokes, her hair swinging over my grandmother's table. After some time, we both stopped calling. And after a while, I thought she was just fine with that. See, I think we all know this story. Uh, but later when Karina is faced with one of um, the hard task of having to apply makeup uh, to Sabrina's dead, dead face and strangled neck to fix things so that family could bear to say goodbye. We know that this story is uniquely Callie's and hers alone. Callie writes about the hard truths in women's lives so knowingly I felt hyper alert as well as implicated and imperiled. This book is about belief, coping, yearning, and proceeding in spite of adversity. The final act of the first story tells us everything we need to know about what territory we'll be entering. In these achingly conceiving, convincing stories, the writer is writing delicately, symbolically about morality itself. But don't take my word for it. Actually, everything I just said were the real pages and pages of reviews all written about Sabrina and Karina applauding uh, Kali's first debut novel. In fact, her debut novel has been given such high esteem that she has been called the Alice Murrow of the High Plains and the Toni Morrison of Indigenous Latinas. And as a Toni Morrison fan myself, I agree. I'm gonna give you another quote. Sometimes a person's unhappiness can make them forget that they're a part of something bigger, something like family, a people, a tribe. These are the words um, in Sabrina and Sabrina, and they are so poignant. And for me, the reason I love this book so much is it because quite simply, it feels like home. And that's why this book should be added to the 1000 books to read before you die list. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was a wonderful description of the book. Um, and this is going to be a tough choice for all of you in the audience who now get a chance to vote. Um, I think let's first, before we do the voting, I'd like a virtual round of applause for our presenters who have done a marvelous job. This is really the best lineup we've had. It's going to be a really tough choice. So thank you all so much. Those of you in the audience will now uh, look for a poll down at the bottom of your screen. Can we post the poll? Okay, you should see it. Um, hosts and panelists can't vote, I just want you to know. So it's all up to you. You should have a poll on your screen and you can vote now. And while you're voting, we're gonna give you a few minutes to do that. Uh, I just like to say a few things about the Denver Public Library. It's a public good and has never been more so than during the pandemic. In addition to 27 branches and three bookmobiles, there are incredible online resources available 24 seven, including databases to help you do everything from repair a vehicle, learn a language, check stock prices, read a newspaper, and even get homework help. Virtual programs for kids, teens, and adults, such as mindful meditation, garden planning, bilingual citizenship study groups, book clubs, story times, and much more. There's curbside pickup and curbside bundles, book stacks curated for each request, personalized reading lists, 24 seven reference help, bookmobile service, online GEDs, and much, much more. It's an oasis of community in what feels sometimes like a desert of divisiveness. Sometimes I think public libraries are the last place where anyone, regardless of their economic status, political affiliation, age, or capacity, can go to find something they're looking for and be welcomed by people who really know what they're talking about. Which is to say, right after this event is over, I hope you will consider going to the library website and make a donation to support its work because it deserves it. Okay. We're still voting, I think, and um, we we'll have our runner up and winner shortly. We keep voting away. I'm going to just read the four titles again No Pepperonis, Just Chicarones, Winter in the Blood, Station Eleven, Humankind, A Hopeful History, and Sabrina and Karina. 
each of which brilliantly described. And um, can't wait to see what the results are. Okay, we have the results. The runner up is David Heska Wanbley Wyden with his case for a winter in the blood. David, congratulations. And the winner is Representative Leslie Herod for her impassioned and, and moving description of Sabrina and Corina. Um, can we get the winner up here with me on the screen, Ashara? There we go. Congratulations. Well done. After that, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, and thanks for voting for our hometown hero. Uh, it's such an honor, and this is a great, great, great book, and all of them were amazing. It was it was a great panel. Thank you for doing it, and and, and so many uh, wonderful themes of, from food and family to heritage, to community, uh, to stories. It was just the kindness, just an absolutely marvelous presentation. Thank you all to all of the presenters and congratulations, Representative Herod, for your victorious performance. Thank um, you so much. Bye. Bye. Right? Before we close, a few more th thoughts. The librarians at Denver Public Library, like the booksellers at Book Bar, are committed to a vocation I share, one best expressed in Christopher Morley's novel, The Haunted Bookshop. And that is to spread good books about, to sow them on fertile minds, to go cultivate understanding and a carefulness of life and beauty. As I write at the conclusion of my introduction to 1000 Books Before You Die, such faith in reading's power and the learning and imagination it nourishes is something I've been lucky enough to take for granted as both fact and freedom. It's something I fear may be forgotten in the great amnesia of our in the moment news feeds and algorithmically defined identities which hide from view the complexity of feelings and ideas that books demand we quietly and determinedly engage. To get lost in a book, be it a story or study, is inherently to acknowledge the voice of another, to broaden one's perspective beyond the confines of one's own understanding. A good book is the opposite of a selfie. The right book at the right time can expand our lives in the way love does, making us more thoughtful, more generous, more brave, more alert to the world's wonders and more pained by its inequities, more wise, more kind. All those qualities are more important now than they've ever been for they are the most enduring antidote to the diseases that darken our days right now. So be safe, be well, read good books, support your library and your local bookstore and know how lucky you are to have both. Thanks to the Denver Public Library for the use of the virtual hall tonight and for the public good it does every day of the year. I'll turn it back to Erica Martinez now to say good night. Thank you all. This has been such an amazing battle. Um, we have we've heard some from some incredible folks. Thanks to our panelists and to all of you for attending tonight. Uh, don't forget to check out our Winter of Reading program which is in full swing. So check it out at denverlibrary.org forward slash winter of reading. And a reminder that all books, all of the books featured this evening are available from Book Bar Denver. And of course, from your favorite Denver Public Library. Thank you so much to everybody. Jim, thank you so much for those kind words. I feel like uh, we need a, a yearly dose of you. So thank you. So <laughs> your support and your kind words um, of libraries. Have a good evening, everybody.